this book was is very much a product of the current political moment. Um, it grew out of what I saw as, as a need to have a broader historical and geographical perspective on the struggle against fascism and white supremacy, uh, especially in the context of the growth of a kind of new wave of American Antifa organizing. Um, in that way, I call the book a, a history theory and politics on the run. The purpose was to get this information out quickly rather than, than doing a kind of uh, a decade-long study as professional historians often do. Um, the, the focus of the book is on Europe and North America um, based on over 60 interviews with current and former anti-fascists from 17 different countries. So I myself have a fair amount of organizing experience but don't have organizing experience in anti-fascist movements. So the purpose of the book is to bring forth the experience and perspectives of people who have in the past and are currently doing this kind of work so that people can, can compare and contrast what they're doing today. Um, the book focuses on the historical trajectory of what in English and Italian is called militant anti-fascism, what is often in French called radical anti-fascism, and in German called autonomous anti-fascism, which is to say a specific tradition within the anti-fascist history that exists at the crossroads of two related considerations. First is it's a pan-radical left politics of social revolution, uh, self-defense applied to fighting the far right. It includes all sorts of socialists and communists and anarchists and leftists. It's an anti-capitalist politics. It's about fighting fascism, but it's also about building a new world and contesting the kind of uh, the claims to sovereignty of the state. Um, related to that, that segues into the second part, which is it's a, a strategy and tactics of direct action. Militant anti-fascists don't turn to the state or the police or courts or, or legislators to stop the far right. They argue that it's 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 all of our jobs to do it. It has to be community response from the bottom up. And in that way, militant anti-fascism is sort of a, an implicit or explicit critique of the state as being the, the uh, safeguard of society. Um, so anti-fascism, there are different schools of anti-fascism. Part of the origin of militant anti-fascism was a kind of debate within the European left where you had in the post-war period, socialist and communist parties that argued for stopping the far right by making it illegal. So in Germany, in Italy, and other countries, efforts to create a new Nazi party or a new fascist party would have been illegal. Um, but moving later into the century, militant anti-fascists argued that the law was insufficient. So in a certain sense, it's kind of a debate within the European left over how to respond to the far right. Um, I think it's important to think of the specific militant anti-fascist tradition and, and understand its contours and its historical context, but I think also sometimes definitions can be limiting. So in the process of writing the book, when I was thinking what is anti-fascism, I also wanted to think what was fascism? What is fascism? Um, and that's a difficult conversation. Historians have debated what fascism is or is not, but I was influenced by what Ami Cesare had to say about uh, the question when he argued that Nazism to some extent can be understood as European imperialism, colonialism, and genocide brought home to the European continent. Um, that's been evident in a number of ways from the fact that the Nazis didn't create the first concentration camps. Um, concentration camps had been built to imprison the indigenous population of the Americas. They were in, in Cuba, built by the Spanish monarchy in the Boer War and so forth. Um, Nazi eugenics policies were greatly influenced by American eugenics policies and, and so forth. So if we take that as a point of departure and think of um, fascism as a specific variant of a global history of white supremacy and authoritarianism and genocide, then we can also think of anti-fascism explicitly understood as such as just one strain of resistance to white supremacy around the world that goes back to 1492 to the first slave ships and so forth. So in that way, I think it's important to understand the specific anti-fascist tradition, but also sort of provincialize it within the larger tradition of resistance. Um, always important to keep in mind. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read an excerpt from the book uh, to sort of bring some of this to life a little bit and talk about some conclusions and lessons we can draw from this history and then move forward from there. So the book is organized into 
chapters. The first, <laughs> the first three chapters are history of the last century. The fourth chapter is lessons from history for anti-fascists. The fifth chapter is all about free speech. So all of those debates you've been having with your friends, you can turn to chapter five and, and, <laughs> and see some ways that anti-fascists have been talking about that. And then chapter six is about strategy, tactics, questions of violence, nonviolence, and so forth. So I'm gonna read a little bit of the beginning of chapter two, which is the immediate post-war history. Okay. The image of British Member of Parliament Mavis Tate flickers onto the screen. I, as a Member of Parliament, visited Buchenwald concentration camp with nine others, she opens. Some people believe that the reports of what happened there are exaggerated cut to stacks of emaciated bodies in the back of a truck. No words could exaggerate, Tate clarifies. We saw and we know. A man attempts to shovel out charred skeletons from industrial ovens. The reality was indescribably worse than the pictures, she adds. Finally, she concludes, let no one say these things were never real. When the projection stopped in this small theater in Northwest London in 1945, Morris Beckman and his cousin Harry Rose filed out into the lobby. Newsreels such as this showed the world a sliver of Nazi horror, but it really wasn't until the 1970s that the Holocaust began to be perceived by both scholars and the general public as an historical event of major importance. But for Jews like Beckman and Rose, the horror could not be more palpable. They knew what post-war newsreels did not say, that most of the twisted corpses up on the screen belonged to adoring Jewish daughters, lovingly eccentric Jewish fathers, tough-as-nails Jewish grandmothers who gave a wry smile every time they recounted surviving the pogroms of their youth. Beckman and Rose didn't need to hear that from Mavis Tate. They were all too aware. They felt sick seeing those bodies like skeletons covered with skin. Both had served in the war, Beckman in the uh, uh, Merchant Marine and Rose in a unit that had fought behind Japanese lines in Burma. As Jewish veterans, Nazism could not have been more personal, and so as they walked home from the theater that day, they could not have been more appalled by what they came upon. A former 18B detainee, and in Britain the 18B detainees were those who had been imprisoned during the war for Nazi sympathies, so they're walking down the street in, in London in 1945, they come across an 18B detainee up on a platform shouting, not enough Jews were burned at Belsen. Not enough Jews were burned at Belsen. I can't believe it, Rose exclaimed. Still wearing his uniform and medals, he went up to a nearby police officer who just shrugged and walked away. Well, I'll get the bastard, Rose said, but his cousin held him back, fearing arrest. But isn't anybody going to do something about this, Rose exclaimed. Over the next few years, the members and sympathizers of the approximately 14 fascist groups in London waged a campaign against the Jewish population with posters reading, Jews must go and war on the Jews. They attacked people in Jewish neighborhoods, they attempted to burn down synagogues, and they even threw bombs into a union meeting. Not long after holding back his cousin from attacking a fascist speaker, um, Beckman and three of his comrades came across another outdoor fascist meeting, this time organized by the British League of Ex-Servicemen and Women. And it's important to, just as an aside, Note that after the war, when the fascists came back, they chose really innocuous names for their groups. They didn't call themselves the British Union of Fascists anymore. They called themselves the British League of Ex-Service Men and Women, right? So in, in when we're having these conversations, it's always important to not take these groups at face value necessarily. Anyway, that day, Jeffrey Hamm, formerly of the British Union of Fascists, was denouncing the, quote, aliens in our midst who profited while our boys fought overseas. The Jewish veterans had enough. This group of four, which included a former uh, judo expert of the Welsh Guards, a Royal Air Force pilot, Beckman, and another veteran, spread out into the crowd of 60. As the judo expert was pretending to buy copies of the League newspaper, he suddenly smashed together the heads of the two fascist stewards while Beckman and the others toppled the stage, dispersing everyone. Beckman exclaimed that, explained that, uh, the sheer malevolence of the speaker moved him and his comrades to shut down a post-war fascist meeting for the first time. It would not be the last time. This direct action sparked the formation in March 1946 of the 43 Group, a militant anti-fascist organization composed mainly, though not exclusively, of Jewish British veterans dedicated to shutting down fascism through direct action and pursuing legislation against racist incitement. The 43 Group Commando units had several methods of shutting down 
fascist meetings. If a single member could get through the fascist guards to tip over the platform, the police had a policy of not allowing the fascists to set it up again. So, with that in mind, the group organized units of about a dozen into wedge formations. They would start far back out into the crowd and at an agreed upon time build up steam so that they could plow through many, time, many times their numbers of muscular fascists and knock over the stage. But so after a while, you know, the fascists saw this coming, so they, they brought extra protection up, up to the platform. So if that were the case, the commandos had a plan B. They would disperse out into the crowd and start arguments and fights all over to the point where the chaos forced the police to shut down the event. Another method was to jump the pitch by occupying the fascist meeting space well before they could get set up. So by the summer of 1946, the 43 group was attacking approximately six to 10 fascist meetings a week. We can't gloss over the fact that in London in 1946, there were six to 10 fascist meetings a week, which is horrible and something that a lot of people don't know. Anyway, Beckman estimates that about a third were disrupted by the group, a third shut down by police, and a third continued as planned. After a while, the 43 group became so successful that locals would join them or even shut down fascist events using similar tactics on their own. With the emergence of the, quote, fucking hard case East End Yids, as the black shirts called them, the, quote, keep your head down and get indoors quickly mentality had gone for good. So what can we learn from the example of the 43 group? Well, I think there's a few points that we can take from this. Uh, the first, I think, is that even in small doses, fascism can be really dangerous. So if you read, for example, the way that uh, historians have talked about the late 1940s in Britain, they, they acknowledge that, sure, there was a revival of fascist organizing in Britain, but they point out that compared to the overall situation, fascism was really small and wasn't a major player in, in the late 40s in Britain. And that's true, right? These, these post-war fascist groups did not have mass memberships. But if you were a Jewish person in the East End of London who had your synagogue defaced and your brother had been attacked and you were afraid to walk out your front door, then for you, this was an awfully big deal. And so I, I think that even if fascist groups don't grow, it's incumbent upon us to recognize that all too often the people who are under attack are not the people that get the sympathy and attention of the broader population. And in that way, I think anti-fascism poses a really uh, important perspective when thinking about mass politics. I think a, a kind of one-dimensional mass politics would have us sort of take an opinion poll of the entire society about what kinds of strategies and methods are palatable and work towards a strategy that way. But if we're in a situation where many people in society are not sympathetic to the plight of those who are under attack, then that complicates the picture. Um, if we think about, for example, the Battle of Cable Street of 1936, I think that's a, a good example to think through. So what happened is about a decade before the events we're thinking about here, uh, the British Union of Fascists, which was the sort of predecessor of, of this organizing, planned a march through the east end of London. Uh, on the day of the march, about 6,000 fascists showed up, but they were confronted by more than 100,000 anti-fascists and Jews and other kinds of immigrants and leftists and so forth. And so ultimately, the, the march was canceled by the police before it could even take uh, its first step. And this was claimed as sort of uh, a great moment in the history of Western European anti-fascism. Hurrah, right? But if you read British newspapers the day after the Battle of Cable Street, do you think that they were really happy about this? No, right? They, they considered it to be um, a kind of uncivilized, quote unquote, response. And they quoted the fascist leadership, which claimed the anti-fascist uh, destroyed our, quote, freedom of speech. So those kinds of debates go back a century. And there have been many cases over the years when fascists have turned to that argument as, as a way to legitimize their organizing. So anyway, the point being, if you had turned to the majority of British society in 1936 and said, how do you think the Jews who are under attack in the East End of London should respond to these fascists? The majority perspective probably would have been, well, write a letter to your member of parliament and hold a sign on the side of the street. <laughs> so if you think that that would have been perhaps insufficient, <laughs> then it's worth thinking about how communities and populations that are under attack need to not always just play by the playbook of those who don't have skin in the game when it comes to responding. 
but even when it, even when fascism grows to the the, the point of, of uh, taking over a regime, we can see that in 1919 Mussolini started out with a hundred men in his first fascist nucleus. When Hitler attended his first meeting of the German Workers Party before the name changed to the Nazi Party, at that time the party had 54 members. Right. So post-war anti-fascists have argued considering that sometimes, of course not always, but sometimes fascist movements start really small and grow big, that every neo-Nazi skinhead and Klan group should be treated as if they could be Mussolini's 100 or Hitler's 54. And it's better to treat these more seriously than they arguably merit than less seriously and be wrong. A, a recent example of that could be uh, the Golden Dawn in Greece, which was a microscopic fascist party for decades, but then after the financial crisis of 2008, balloons to be the third largest party in Greece, fully outfitted with a fascist goon squad that attacks all sorts of people they deem undesirable. And I met with some anti-fascists in Greece in 2012 who were kicking themselves for not taking this more seriously a few years earlier. So this is, this is something that can always happen. Um, also, I think the example of the 43 group shows that uh, militant anti-fascist methods can be awfully effective. Um, they started in 1946 with 43 members, which is why they were called the 43 group. They were having a meeting trying to discuss what to call themselves. Debates were going back and forth. And after a while, someone in the back of the room says, there's 43 of us. Let's call ourselves the 43 group and be done with it, which I think is a wonderful example of expediency and organizing. <laughs> so, so anyway, a few years later, their, their membership grew up. I think uh, probably hit a peak around 300. Um, and by 1949, they, they disbanded because the, the fascist threat in their perspective had receded. Um, there are plenty of other examples that I discuss in the book, and many more that I don't, of anti-fascist methods being successful in stopping these groups. The, the irony of the conversation, though, is that militant anti-fascism works its best when people don't know about it. Because if you stop a group before it grows, no one cares that you stop them. So that's kind of the, the, the irony of it. Even if you look at the American uh, Anti-Racist Action Network, had a lot of really significant victories and achievements, um, but it didn't get to the point where mainstream society was especially concerned about the far right, and therefore it wasn't even part of a conversation. Most Americans don't even know what happened. Um, what else? OK. Um, did that one, did that one, did that one. Uh, a few of the things that, that post-war anti-fascists have kind of concluded from the early history when they look at organizing efforts against Mussolini and Hitler, uh, Mussolini in, all right, I'm a little fried, I'm doing this a lot. My Mussolini's and Hitler's sometimes get blended into Mussolini Hitler. All right, <laughs> organizing against Mussolini in Italy and Hitler in Germany. Okay, got those straight. Um, they point to the fact that uh, the European left largely failed to get on the same page to combat the, the common enemy. So if you look at Italy, uh, the Arditi del Popolo was the militant anti-fascist militia that was formed in 1921 to take up rifles and go to defend villages and towns against the fascist black shirts. Initially, it was a pan-radical left militia, um, but shortly thereafter, the Socialist Party withdrew their support the new Communist Party withdrew their support. So towards the end, the only institutional support the RDT had came from the anarchist movement, though rank and file members from all factions continued. Excuse me. Similarly, or even more pronounced in, in Germany, especially after 1928, when the Communist International labeled socialists, quote, social fascists, uh, and socialists were no more fond of communists, uh, the, the German left was more preoccupied with their internal struggle than opposition to the Nazis. In part, that was because really until the Great Depression, the Nazi party was microscopic. But even when Hitler took power in 1933, the slogan of the German Communist Party was, perhaps uh, the slogan that has aged the worst of any slogan I can think of, <laughs> was, first Hitler, then us by which they meant they figure Hitler would get into power, he'd do a terrible job in government, and then six months, nine months later, the Communist Party could ride his coattails into successful government. So why, why on earth did they think that? Well, I think in part because a lot of anti-fascists in the 20s and 30s did not really understand that fascism represented something different from traditional European reactionary politics. So reaction had existed in European politics since there was revolution, right? Uh, there had been repression of the Paris Commune. 
of the revolution of 1905, early anti-fascists in the 20s compared the fascists to the white guards in Russia or the black and tans in the British Isles. And there was an understanding this is kind of cyclical. They didn't necessarily recognize that fascism and Nazis imposed existential threats to, well, most people or a lot of people. Um, so they were willing to say, okay, fine, this will be a period of reaction starting in 1933, maybe in 1934 we'll push back in the other direction. But that wasn't what happened. Um, so that's, I think, one reason why I think it's incumbent upon us to always pay attention to shifts and changes in far-right politics, never assume it's always the same, never assume it's always going to uh, take the same kind of resistance to stop it, because I think that was something that the European left did. But it wasn't so much just the European left as a whole, it was more the leadership of these parties, because if you actually look at where the, uh, the, where the initiatives for pan-radical left unity, for anti-fascist unity came, they often came from below. And arguments for aggressive militant responses often came from the lived experiences of people who had their neighborhoods and their union halls and their taverns attacked and destroyed and taken over, who said, you know what, we cannot wait for the next election. We need to organize now. Um, so I think that's also another kind of lesson to be taken from this. Um, really, I think that you can see at a high level, the European left start to take it seriously a little bit in 1934 with the socialist resistance to a right-wing government in, in Austria. Uh, that same year, a right-wing government took over uh, the Spanish Republic, and when there was a miners' uprising in Asturias in northern Spain, their slogan was, better Vienna than Berlin. Because in, Ven in Vienna, in Austria, the socialists rose up against the right-wing government. In Berlin, they did not. So you start to see a shift where the European left is saying, we can't let this continue, and then you have the Spanish Civil War. When leftists across the political spectrum, at least for six months, nine months, on the face of things, <laughs> were on the same page. Uh, that didn't work out so well. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you want to. Um, but the, the, certainly, it, the, the threat was treated with the gravity it deserved. There was kind of an anti-fascist domino theory. If we don't stop fascism in Spain, it'll threaten all sorts of other places. Now, this, is, this history is sort of well charted, but the post-war history is less so. Um, literature that exists in English does a good job charting this history in Britain, not so well elsewhere. Um, as we talked about, fascism re-emerged in Britain in the 40s, but moving into the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the far right in Britain shifted from targeting the Jewish population primarily to targeting new waves of migration from the Caribbean, South Asia, and elsewhere. Uh, the fascist National Front organized a Keep Britain White campaign, and helped to foster the growth of a neo-Nazi skinhead movement. Um, for those who don't know, skinhead uh, culture and tradition was originally anti-racist, and there's been an anti-racist current in it up through to today. But in the 70s, there was an effort to, to make this about white power politics. So um, this was an important cultural influence in the growth of the far right in Europe, North America, and elsewhere during this period. And in response to that, um, anti-fascists in Britain organized the Rock Against Racism concert series. Uh, with bands like The Clash and The Specials, Steel Pulse and others. Um, and historians of music credit um, Rock Against Racism with it being uh, the first time that white British society as a whole came into sustained contact with Jamaican music, which I think is an interesting thing to, to point out. Similar developments were happening on the continent, but as I mentioned at the outset, under different circumstances. So in Britain, the far right was essentially allowed to reorganize right off the bat. And in that way, the militant anti-fascist tradition in Britain from the 1920s to the present is largely unbroken. You can trace the individuals and groups each generation through. Um, it was a little different in continental Europe where the governments that emerged out of the ashes of World War II established themselves as officially anti-fascist institutions. That was true in the East and in the West. Um, even the original name for the Berlin Wall was the anti-fascist defensive barrier. If you're curious why that was, that you can make a note of that for the Q&A, but I'm not gonna get into that here. And so the idea was that the governments weren't gonna allow this to happen, again, by making it illegal. That had mixed results. Um, but by the 70s, 80s, and 90s, in different countries, a far-right presence had re-emerged. In Germany, especially around the fall of the Berlin Wall, a neo-Nazi skinhead movement, to some extent influenced by developments in Britain, started to attempt to burn down refugee centers and attack all sorts of people. Um, a member of the American Olympic bobsled team was assaulted. Amnesty International issued a report condemning the inactivity of the German government. And so the response to that on the street was largely done by the, the autonomous movement and their transition into an autonomous anti-fascist movement. 
Um, some of these groups in the late 80s and 90s were actually organized by uh, Turkish migrants for self-defense. And you can see in some of the early periodicals, the, the texts were in, in German and Turkish. Um, so that's where you have the origin of the Black Bloc tactic. Black Bloc is not an organization or a group. It is a street tactic of people who um, carry out militant activities under a kind of veil of anonymity by dressing uniformly in black and covering their faces. We can talk about that more later if you're interested, but it grew out of, out of that, that period. Um, and I think really in post-war European anti-fascism, the two kind of most influential trajectories would be the British and the German. If we go over to the, the case of the United States, certainly we can think, we, we, we ought to recognize that the peoples of the Americas have been no stranger to resisting white supremacy or domination. Um, when we think of when fascism started, some have argued for seeing maybe the KKK as the first proto-fascist formation. And if, if you are sympathetic to that, then certainly anti-Klan resistance could be considered a kind of anti-fascism. Likewise, looking at groups like the Black Panthers, the American Indian Movement, talking about the fascism of police occupation of, of colonialism and so forth, we can talk about it through there. Um, but in terms of those who were explicitly influenced by the specifically militant anti-fascist tradition, you can pretty much start with anti-racist action, which formed in the late 1980s uh, and grew in the 90s to be a network with hundreds of chapters and thousands of members across North America. They developed um, four points of unity, which I think are, are helpful to think through the politics of what this is about. Um, the first was, um, we go where they go. So an argument for always having a counter protest, always having a response when the far right mobilizes. Um, this may be out of order, but that doesn't matter. Uh, we don't turn to the police or the state to stop the far right. So that's a, a key tenet to this politics, arguing for popular resistance, not trusting the state or the police. Um, uh, a defense of reproductive rights, because uh, some of what anti-fascist, uh, anti-racist action did was to show up at abortion clinics and defend uh, reproductive rights from what they considered to be Christian fascists, and non-sectarian defense of all anti-fascists, so a pan-radical left politics. But you can see that within those points of unity, there's a lot of room for people from all sorts of perspectives to get on board. And so that helped it grow and really establish itself as an important youth culture, pushing back against the far right presence in the punk scene and other alternative cultures. Um, Anti-racist action groups came, went to schools and did popular educational events and participated in Palestine solidarity campaigns and did a wide variety of, of organizing. Um, they were influenced by the example of anti-fascist action in Britain, but chose to label themselves anti-racist action because they thought that that language worked better in the context of the US. And what's interesting is, is I'm sure there are some folks in the audience who are well-versed in recent anti-fascist developments and are familiar with the two main symbols of anti-fascism, the one being the three arrows, the other being the two flags. And we can talk about where they came from if people are curious, but Looking at anti-racist action periodicals from the 90s, it's striking to see they're, they're not there. They weren't really symbols that were used by ARA in the 90s too much. Um, you can really see their use growing from the greater awareness that American anti-fascists had of the European history, but specifically the German history starting in the late 2000s into the early 20 teens when you start to have groups calling themselves not necessarily ARA but Antifa, like Rose City Antifa in Portland, NYC Antifa, and so forth. A similar change happened in Britain around the same time. The symbolism of the British anti-fascist action was largely the uh, red triangle, taken from the example of the Holocaust as a, as a symbol for the persecution of socialists, but they reclaimed it as an anti-fascist symbol. But starting in the late 2000s, early 20 teens, greater influence from Germany with the symbols of the German movement. So I'm interested in symbols. There's a little symbol history. I'm gonna say a few more things and then we'll, we'll open it up. How are we doing, is Grace around? How are we doing on time? All right. Yeah, okay. All right, I'll say a few more things and then we'll take like one or two and then we'll open it. All right, so when I speak to journalists, which I have done uh, about this topic, <laughs> they are, they, they, they're like, oh, I'm interested in learning about anti-fascism, but they're really only interested in masks and violence and masks. Uh, so, so what I try to explain is that, that, that the militant anti-fascist tradition has a broad range of organizational forms and, and looks and histories, and there, there is no one box to put it into. Um, this was brought home to me by some comments made to me by an anti-fascist from Madrid named, named Daniel, 
or Daniel, um, who explained that in his perspective, there are two faces of anti-fascism. And he said, we, should, we must never forget either face. The first is that which stops the organizing of the far right, prevents them from embedding themselves in communities, normalizing their heinous ideas, becoming legitimate in any way. The other is that which aims to inoculate society from the appeals of fascism, so that when there's an economic depression, people don't blame immigrants, they organize with their coworkers, they organize in their communities, and, and therefore anti-fascism becomes self-evident common sense and not sort of a quote unquote professionalized activity. Not to suggest that anti-fascists are being paid by Soros because that is, <laughs> that is not true. If anyone wants to know, that's not true. Um, so anyway, I think that there's more to be said about that, but I, I want to not go on too long. There, it, this is a, a wide political field, and uh, there's a lot of different ways this can look and take, and it's important to have all of them as a movement. So I'll leave it at there. Let's take a couple questions and then uh, take a book break. In the back, yes. Hi, yeah, I'm, my name's Jared. I'm a member of Freedom Socialist Party. I was interested in what you said about, um, well, just what you said about the inoculation uh, and also before you were talking about the uh, anti-fascist movements being notwithstanding in history, and I wonder if there's kind of a link between that and the link being, you know, both the need, the immediate need, which is to, you know, form a united front to stop fascism, but also have that be, have that movement extend to, you know, a united uh, action, a united group on the left that would then, you know, uh, enact, you know, for instance, revolution. Then sure. Right, right. And, and that's a key part to the politics. Militant anti-fascists don't just want to stop fascism. And I read an, an interview that's coming out soon on It's Going Down, so keep an eye out for it, that some comrades did with a German member of the autonomous movement who's been active since the 80s. And he explained that in his perspective, to some extent, the anti-fascist movement was sort of a recruiting tool to try and build a revolutionary movement. And so for him, fighting fascism was only sort of one part of the conversation. And certainly the ways that militant anti-fascists have chosen to fight fascism are also sort of a, a prefigurative challenge to the sovereignty of the state, are, are fundamentally anti-capitalist kinds of perspectives. So certainly the, the interview subjects I spoke to would, I think, all agree that if you don't stop the causes of fascism, fascism is always a threat. One of them obviously is capitalism. Others are patriarchy, white supremacy, et cetera, et cetera. So in that way, you can, you can uh, the, the, the cheesy metaphor that I like to use is the, an, seeing anti-fascism as a kind of accordion that can be opened or closed depending on what note you're trying to play. You can, you can close it and say, okay, this is militant anti-fascism, or open it up and say, well, actually it's revolution and everything in between. So yes. Uh, yes, over here. I just want to know what you think about uh, Chom Chomsky's, Chomsky's quote on the sure. and yeah. uh, what you said um, about how it's a minuscule fringe on the left and that it's a major beef to the right. Sure. Um, so for those who don't know, um, Noam Chomsky uh, was critical of militant anti-fascism, saying, among other things, that it's fringe and that it is a gift to the, to the far right. Um, I love Noam Chomsky. It gives me no pleasure to disagree with Noam Chomsky, but I disagree with Noam Chomsky. Um, just to say a few things, there is actually a fairly substantive historical track record of militant anti-fascist organizing working. He did not make reference to that. Um, I, I, I think that's one place to start, is that we can have a legitimate conversation on the pros and cons of different forms of politics, but it should be in reference to what's actually happened. Um, so I'm not sure his familiarity with that history, but that history is relevant. Um, in that history is all sorts of examples of the far right not being too happy about Antifa. Even today, we can see that the far right go to great lengths to prevent anti-fascists from finding out where their events are, who their identities are so they don't get doxxed, from organizing self-defense. So if they're really psyched about being doxxed and shut down, why would they bother? They'd say, here we are, come shut us down. Um, so I, I think that the way that far-right movements grow is not entirely dissimilar to how left movements grow, right? You need to have bases in the community, you need to engage in projects, you need to meet people's needs, you need to normalize your perspective so they are seen as common sense, you need to put out your information in the web, in person, flyers, have events, become part of society. And so it seems to me to stop that is you stop all those little facets, which is essentially what militant anti-fascist politics are. Um, 
it's, it's no panacea. It's not like this organizing strategy always works because no organizing strategy always works. But I think that as a whole, it has a strong legacy. And I don't know of a better way to stop these people than to stop them. Um, has there always yeah. been a critique of this oh, strategy? There's always been a critique of every strategy. Um, but certainly, you know, the, the main conversation in the European left was do we stop them, quote unquote, respectably by making it illegal and then basically turning it to the police to stop them? Or do we organize to shut them down ourselves? Or there have been some that have argued for both. I would think that he would know the history. I, just think I don't know what he does or does not know, but I do know that in, the in, the, in his quotes, he hasn't referenced that history. So I can get. Um, how about we do a book break, Grace? Yeah. All right, let's just take a five minute, so for people who want to pick up the book, shameless plug for acquiring my book. <laughs> And then we will reconvene. Uh, did you want to? Oh, yeah. yeah. I was just wondering if there are significant differences um, between both fascist and anti-fascist organizing, like in the US and Europe. OK, and maybe great. And what wonder who those might be. Yeah, sure. So um, certainly there have been, so the cultural milieu is one thing to talk about. So I mean, to be, to be Antifa in Europe often has a very strong cultural component um, connected to football, connected to music. Um, there are plenty of people who identify as such who don't necessarily do organizing but will show up to a demo or think of themselves as such in the context of pushing fascists out of football scenes and so forth. <laughs> there, there is a growing component of that in the U.S. There are anti-fascist supporters groups at many different uh, MLS teams and so forth. Um, the music component goes back farther, certainly in the punk scene of the 80s and 90s, but that's sort of like, as a slightly different kind of connotation that's often missed in the conversation is that it's also kind of a, a cultural marker. Um, the other thing is, is, I keep coming back to this, but I think it's really interesting to, to understand is that militant anti-fascism is sort of one side of a, a debate within the left in Europe about how to respond to these things. And so you have a situation where this, like the state in Germany is we are anti-fascist. So there's a contestation over who are the anti-fascists in a way that the American government does not claim to be anti-fascist, uh, doesn't even know what that really means. Um, so I spoke to one anti-fascist who was organizing in Germany and he explained to me that for him and his comrades, it was important to, going back to sort of the question over here, always put forth a kind of revolutionary anti-capitalist critique while they did their anti-fascist work because if they didn't, they'd essentially be just sort of mirroring the, the perspective of the government and therefore not really kind of advancing a broader struggle. Um, that's a consideration that doesn't really exist here. And also, I mean, the, the, the question of free speech becomes very different because if you have governments that are making it illegal for these groups to organize, then it changes the whole conversation about speech. Um, in the Anglo-American tradition, that's a different kind of orientation than in, in those other countries. Those are a few things that, that come to mind along, along those lines. And then just to comment quickly on kind of far-right organizing, there has been a, a greater influence of the kind of identitarian French New Right on American far-right organizing. Um, so Richard Spencer with the, the alt-right and that was influenced by this kind of European perspective of, in short, taking a page out of kind of struggles for national liberation by portraying white people and whiteness as kind of one demographic with its own claim to rights the same as other demographics and trying to shift from the kind of outwardly uh, white supremacist rhetoric to a more explicitly white nationalist but still white supremacist rhetoric. So there's been sort of some of those influences as well. Um, and uh, yes. Yeah, some of this sounds like the things that I've seen in going all the way back to the anti-war movement uh, 40 plus years ago mm. here. You would, you would have a mass march mm -hmm. organized by a large coalition mm -hmm. and then you would have some people who wanted to uh, break off and, and sure. maybe dress differently or, or sure. like Spanish windows. Or yeah. Do more, in their mind, more militant action. Right. Yeah. And the the usual way of, and I saw something very similar here in uh, June 10th when we had a very good march against the Islamophobic groups at City Hall. <coughs> and uh, uh, you, it was uh, uh, like a hundred times larger than the, uh, the mm -hmm. alt-right people. Sure. Uh, but I could see that what was going on was you had the the uh, the 
uh, neo-fascists mm -hmm. deliberately moving in, mm -hmm. trying to push into that march and start fights. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, it reminded me of the, the fact that when you have someone who is a fascist, he's not afraid of being punched in the face. They want to be punched in the face because now they want mm -hmm. to take and be punched, and then that justifies their their victimhood. Understood. So uh, the way this was dealt mm -hmm. with, uh, the anti-war and the civil rights movement mm -hmm. was, you always would get the people who are physically uh, strong and and brave to be your martial force, mm -hmm. and you would you would recruit people who were more militant to be marshals. Sure. And they would protect the group against. Uh, attacks from the right, attack, but also sometimes attacks from Maoists. The Maoists would try to seize the stage or okay. something like that. So, uh, and there was a lot of tragedies. You had the uh, nor a group that was a uh, militant communist who mm -hmm. left New York, where they had a kind of reputation of mixing it up, not with fascists, but with liberals and other uh, progressives. And they went to North Carolina, and they were marching uh, with slogans like "Death of the Klan." Well, the Klan said no death to you and killed like right Greensboro people. sure so yeah. it was not a successful tactic to, to try that and in fact they victim uh, some people were victimized okay so I'd like to compliment people who are brave enough to be able to mix it up but it mm -hmm. was just always understood with, with a defensive formulation understood uh, don't talk about free speech at all mm -hmm. just be there when people need to be defended okay and the uh, the other thing is that they are uh, uh, you always are going to be infiltrated. Mm -hmm. so the person who's talking about throwing, you know, Molotov cocktails or is the, the most radical person in your group, uh, one of five of you is probably a police in uh, provocative. Okay. This is a tactic that has hundreds of years. Indeed. Police, uh, you know. Indeed. Uh, in, Tactics. Going okay. Back to the Russian right. So the three things there to address. The first is the kind of uh, post-war militancy, which you're entirely right to sort of mark the continuity. That I think that there's something to be said for a kind of shift in uh, the global north, or at least the the not the Eastern Eastern Bloc's different conversation, but about a kind of street militancy that existed with a certain leeway for militancy that you can see with the Days of Rage, that you can see with May 68, and that the, the militant anti-fascist tradition is part of this and grows out of this, is a part of the same conversation. Uh, <coughs> all sorts of examples. Um, another thing to, to um, comment on is certainly um, you're right that when you organize against the far right, there is a good chance they're going to attack you. Uh, they, they do that. Um, and we can uh, just, there's all sorts of ways to respond to that. But I think that certainly being ready for self-defense is important. I think you're right about that. But I'm, I'm not convinced that the media always recognizes the difference between offense and defense. Right, so even in the right. scenario you're talking about, right, they they were going to portray the scenario you're talking about as clashes at best or aggression at worst. So I think that there's there's a the the strategies and tactics are sometimes discussed as if people involved can kind of take a step back, think it over, and then decide how they're going to be covered, and that's that's not the case, right? So so I think that that any questions about offense and defense need to take that into account. Um, do they like to get punched in the face? Well, I mean, I mean, some of them, some of them do, right? I mean, or at least some of them claim to like it. Um, I've heard plenty of stories, though. I mean, uh, to some extent, fascism back then and fascism today is predicated on a uh, an alleged virility, masculinity, power, prowess, domination, and a lot of the main recruiters in these groups get impressionable young people, especially men, to join them because they can project that power. Based on some of the interviews I've done, some people, some anti-fascists have claimed that one way to drain them of that recruiting power is to physically humiliate them by making it so that, that they are overwhelmed and therefore unable to project that kind of power. So I think that certainly there is a political value in successfully physically defeating fascists, um, even if they claim to like it. Uh, and some of them maybe do. I mean not the most savory group of people. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that physical confrontation is, is counterproductive. And even if they like it, if you win, then that can be helpful as well. Um, as far as the, the infiltrator thing, I mean, yeah, there, there's a lot of infiltrators now and in the past. They're all over. It's hard to avoid that, um, although some groups avoid it simply by not bringing in new members, which is one way to do it. Um, but. 
I, I think also there's another side of it, which is the snitch jacketing side, which is assuming that someone who is proposing someone something militant is necessarily an informant, uh, which isn't always true. It's tough to figure out what's going on. I have no great wisdom to impart about that, but I think there's two sides to the conversation. Uh, there was in the back, yeah, okay, let's, yeah, let's go with you, sure. Please do, question. yes. And they include reproductive uh -huh. rights. And I'm wondering, if, if, if you were talking to people, it feels like that's dropped out. Okay. And just if you had, if that came up in conversations or in your interviews, or like you have ideas of how that dropped out and how it's coming back, if it's coming back, is it? Sure. Financials certainly haven't dropped it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, first to, to sort of explain the kind of organizational lineage is that the anti-racist action network declined into the late 2000s and sort of gave way to what's now the Torch Network, which is sort of the successor of that. Um, and I believe that the points of unity are rather similar. Um, if there's anyone here who knows that slightly, but I think they're rather similar. Um, I think that they include the sort of clause about being opposed to domination in all its forms. But I don't know how much organizing is being done specifically around that issue. I just don't know. Um, but I do know that there is uh, a flexible interpretation and a certain a focus on feminist and gender issues that a lot of groups have, but... And... And there, there are groups doing a wide variety of organizing. Um, for example, in Montreal, there's a Food Against Fascism which is kind of a response to the effort by the far right to serve food to, I guess, probably just to white people, really, right? Um, <laughs> so there, there are different organizational responses. As far as that specifically, I'm not sure of any current initiatives. Yeah, GDC. No, but with reproductive rights? Yeah. Okay, can you share? Okay. The GDC, uh, General Defense Committee of the IWW in uh, Minneapolis has done, what have they done? Just like reproductive, like they're, you know, protecting have done that work apparently yeah, so definitely. there you have it but 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 it's it's good it's good to do and, and, and other groups should do it too yes yes <laughs> I have a question about um, Dartmouth's original statement about your work how that was revived um, what kind of your experience what happened with that and how tenured faculty can support contingent faculty who Great. might not have a best book and beyond you know like yeah yeah for sure yeah, okay, so just to give the background for people who aren't familiar, um, and there are open seats if people wanna sit down, go right ahead. Um, so when my book came out and I started doing media, actually um, the kind of, the, the, the everyday, there's, everyday Dartmouth people get an email with like, what's going on at Dartmouth? And so in the beginning, there was a thing from an interview I did in the Boston Globe, like, hey, our Mark Bray was in the news, that's cool. But uh, after I was on Meet the Press, um, the trolls came out and contacted the president of the college and campus reform, which is like a Breitbart for kids, reached out <laughs> to the president and he gave a comment very quickly without talking to me or talking to my department or, or looking into my work at all, condemning what he called quote unquote violent protests, taking it out of context, et cetera, et cetera. And that sort of was picked up by Breitbart and Fox News and all the death threats came in and everything and it became um, a situation. Um, shortly thereafter, um, some mainly historians of people in other departments started a, uh, a letter of solidarity supporting my academic freedom, explaining actually what it is that I was saying, which was misrepresented and was signed by more than 120 Dartmouth faculty. When that happened, the president issued another statement basically being, oh, no, no, I, I was supporting his academic freedom. We're good. This is, it's okay. Um, so that was kind of the end of that. And it shows you, of course, the power of, well, I mean, in a basic sense, workplace solidarity. Um, but in the specific case of the university, what happens if the faculty support you? Now, part of the backstory there is that the Dartmouth College president is unpopular, to say the least. He's done a lot of things that people have a lot of issues with. The community is not too psyched about him. The faculty is not too psyched about him. They were looking for an opportunity to be against him. They took it. Um, but there are other, plenty of other left academics who are not so fortunate with the amount of support they get. And... Um, it's certainly a scary time uh, 
And, and, the, and the kind of irony of it is there's this debate about free speech, but really those who are trying to limit it are, are the right wingers who are trying to take any reference to race or gender or popular resistance as, as making it um, you know, a new kind of McCarthy era. Um, Certainly, I think workplace solidarity is important. I think also in a, in a broader sense, I think it, it's worthwhile for us to not simply fall back on a kind of neutral, classically liberal interpretation of free speech, but actually to put forward politics and values and say, you know what, these kinds of statements that, you know, um, George Ciccarello Mars comments about, um, you know, the, 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 the deadliness of white masculinity, that that is a legitimate comment to make and that this is backed by a lot of research and a lot of uh, evidence and that talking about anti-fascism is a legitimate political tradition, historical legacy and and it's tough, but we need to support each other. Um, certainly, I, I, um, I'm an adjunct and so certainly the president rushed to his statement more than he probably would have if I were a uh, tenured faculty, and that's part of the conversation as well. And really, I think for me, a lot of this points back to labor issues um, and the university. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Okay, uh, <laughs> lots, lots of hands. Um, well, let's go in the back here with you, and then we'll work this way. Uh, you had mentioned uh, previously about some of the different subcultures, like the punk scene and the football scene. Sure that sort of built this culture of anti-fascism and fascism. And one thing I've noticed being sort of in like the nerd subculture is that that group has sort of gone to the fascist side very strongly. Okay. Are there any tactics that maybe like the punks used or people who felt like they were on the outside to sort of build up that anti-fascist uh, feeling? And yeah. Spread that around? Do you think it would work today? So yeah, that's a great question because from what I've read and what I've heard, there have been efforts by the far right to infiltrate all sorts of subcultural scenes, metal, folk music, bronies, you name it. Um, and so I think it is important for people involved in those scenes to push back. And that's the kind of conversation that I think a lot of kind of mainstream pundits are really dismissive of. But the fabric of our society are these different groups and cultures and identities and communities, and you don't let them take over any of them. Um, there's a really neat documentary that I would recommend folks check out. The English title is The Anti-Fascists, and it's about the movements in Sweden and Greece, and it came out like nine months ago. And they've got this interview with this Greek anti-fascist who, uh, who gives his three theses on anti-fascism, and one of them is you don't let them solidify themselves in any kind of community. Um, now, how to do that? Well, I think part of it, I mean, so if you look at the Rock Against Racism, their slogan was NF, which stood for National Front, but NF equals no fun. And I think that's sort of like a, a foundational way of kind of thinking about it in terms of pushing back and making it, taking whatever the values are of the community and trying to emphasize that they don't stand for those values and that they're against those values and that, you know, you're not cool if you are down with them. As, as far as any specific community that's gonna look different, um, but I think seeing it as a cultural struggle is part of it. Um, yeah, but please do kick them out of there, wherever there is. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned before that, you know, you, you can track kind of like individuals and groups over generations, like, you know, in, in terms of like far right or fascist recruitment, like is there anything new under the sun? Are there things that are unique to kind of our current historical political moment or is it the same mechanisms in a different context like that? Yes and no. I mean, I think some of the fu fundamental things have continued, but I mean, certainly, so the efforts to try to make the far right respectable are not entirely new, but not entirely old, right? So like like David Duke tried to go from being the Klan leader who wore the, the, the robes to the Klan leader who wore the suit to get into office. You know, there have been efforts Earlier on, um, I interviewed Daryl Lamont Jenkins from One People's Project, who he's someone who's been monitoring the far right for a long time. In his opinion, the, a real crucial turning point towards the kind of mainstreaming of the far right was the growth of the Minutemen around 2004, and that was a situation where the far right had an entryway into something that had kind of a, a mainstream connection to it around pushing back against immigration and, and f fostering xenophobia. Um, the, the notion of the alt-right is an attempt to try and put aside neo-Nazi skinheads, clan robes, make it respectable, middle class, all these are in quotes, uh, intellectual, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
And so certainly, right, efforts to push back against that have to try to tear off the veneer. Um, to some extent, I think that happened after Charlottesville. It's really tragic that it took Heather Heyer's death and all that conflict for some people to be like, wait, these are just Nazis. <laughs> um, but it, it kind of did kind of did take that, and I hope that it'll stick. On the other hand, though, I think it is worth recognizing that efforts to make far-right politics seem respectable make it so that the ways to fight them can sometimes be different. Um, certainly, I discussed that the most in chapter three of the book, in mainly in the context of Europe, where there have been far-right parties that have grown very popular over the last few years, the Front National in France and the Party for Freedom in the Netherlands, there's all sorts of examples. To some extent, that has caused certain anti-fascist groups to shift their orientation, to dissolve, to focus on different kinds of politics because when these parties are massive, they're in parliament, they have support from all sorts of demographics of society, you can't just push them off the streets. Which is not to say that you can't also push them off the streets, but you can't just push them off the streets. Um, and so in that way, you know, it, it requires a, a broader conversation and really a broader working class movement of resistance. Um, so to some extent, some new, some old. Um, yeah. Uh, let's go in the back, yeah. Um, I read the book and enjoyed it. I was Thank you. disappointed in one way that um, there was no mention of the Blues Brothers. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I imagine you've uh, met a lot of criticism of it, but um, one piece that I read in particular was written by Diane Johnstone. And I wondered Is that the counterpunch one? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. wondered if, maybe you've responded to it elsewhere, but I wondered if what your response to that was. Um, to be honest, I haven't read it. Um, there was just so much going on at the time, and... I, I haven't. Do you want to like, pick something out of it and I can respond to it now? Um, <laughs> Sorry I to disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It was a little straw managed to Yeah, I'm sorry. I haven't read it. I, I, I really try not to Google myself. So I really, I really, I don't, really don't know what's going on out there, and that's okay with me. Um, anyone else want to? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, have any of your family members read your book, and do you have any discussions, arguments about? My parents are almost done with it. Um, my, my mother is sweet. She says she will read any book I ever write, and I say, really, you don't have to do that. <laughs> um, but she is reading it, and her main thing is that she she's she's a she's center left. Um, but not, didn't, does, I don't come from a radical family. Um, and so she's like, oh, I realized that like, for you, liberal's a dirty word. <laughs> um, so, so I was like, but, but, I was like, Ma, you're more of a progressive or maybe a social democrat. And she's like, okay. And she, I mean, <laughs> um, so that, I don't know, my, my parents aren't, aren't of the same politics as me, but like are supportive and, and that's, that's pretty cool. Okay, let's go over here. Inside of like contemporary anti-fascist struggle, at least in the U.S., one thing that I see and encounter constantly is this concept of optics. Because I think it's mm. a stupid word. Mm -hmm. I think what we mean is like we're trying to make ourselves feel important when we talk about media. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. there's a continual conversation about the necessity of no platform mm -hmm. with the fact that no platform is terrifying, mm. and the way in which that that tactic and that angle is often pretty alienating to kind of the center left. Okay. And there's this constant battle back and forth of being like, is this tactic worthwhile if it's going to seem marginal but and marginalize the participants, mm. but gets the job done in terms of no platform? Great question, is yeah. Is there a historical precedent for there being a necessity to have popular opinion upon, like, like behind you? I haven't found one where I can say like, yes, these fascists were beat because everyone hated them like, in the same way that the people who were actively opposing them did. Great. So the first thing is, I, I think it, it's somewhat useful um, to sort of disaggregate the concept of no platform from any necessary method of, of enforcing it. I'm, I'm imagine you'd agree, right? Um, so there are all sorts of ways of, to deny fascists a platform. Um, even uh, the poop protest out in California, where people brought their dogs poop, mm -hmm. 
and laid it where the fascists were going to get set up, essentially deprived the fascists of a platform. Um, all of the pressure that was brought to bear on like the web servers and forums that hosted the far right after Charlottesville, that's a, de that's a deprival of platforms. There's all sorts of ways to do it. One of them, though, is to physically stop them from having a platform um, in the way that, for example, the 43 group did in, in the example of the Battle of Cable Street. Those are sort of physical platform denial examples. That, of course, is really what we're talking about, right, is, is are the examples that get that kind of popular attention. But I think it's worth thinking through, like, why is it that people loved the poop, pro the poop protest? Well, not everyone did, right? But it got, it was sort of like a, a liberal feel-good moment. It's like, yeah, just bring your dog poop. Now, <laughs> that, of course, I mean, if we're talking about the question of um, free speech conversations, that's no different from physically shutting them down as far as I can tell when it comes to questions of speech. So I think that that's, but that's not really where we're going with this question, right? Um, so the, the broader question is, is um, as I think you correctly criticized it, the, no, the language of optics, which I think, yes, is, is a way to make it seem more thought out than it, than it really, and the question of popular politics. I don't think there's any um, trans-historical universal connection between the two. I think there are times when, yeah, popular society will support militant anti-fascist tactics. There are times when they won't. Um, I spoke to one anti-fascist from Barcelona who said something interesting, and, and this does not apply to how all anti-fascists think of it, but I think it's a useful point of departure for this issue, is he said, and I was, I was a little surprised at first to hear, he said, I don't care if people hate anti-fascists, because when we do what we do and it works, that's fine, people can hate anti-fascists, because when I take off my mask, I'm a union organizer, my, the people that I organize with love me, my community loves me, I build over here and I destroy over here, essentially. And so for him, he was emphasizing that not all politics need to be done in the same container. And if you, if you get the job done and you destroy fascism, then you can sort of like leave all the baggage of that over there and do work elsewhere. Now, that is one way of looking at it. Um, that is neither right nor wrong. It's a contextual, it's how you look at it. Um, but another way of looking at it, I think, is to really try to make the argument, right? People, I think, sometimes assume that popular perspectives are fixed, but they're not. And so even if you look at, like, so an example of a comment going in the other direction would be the Netherlands. From what I've been told, people in the 90s were maybe if they didn't necessarily love what anti-fascists did, they had enough of a recent memory of uh, the Holocaust and World War II to say, okay, if you're punching a Nazi, he is a Nazi, fine. But apparently this shifted after the murder of Pim Fortune, who was this, like, demagogue radio personality who was killed by, um, uh, some kind of an animal rights activist. And that shifted popular perspective about questions of, of no platforming and speech and violence. It can also shift in the other direction. I think that there have been important shifts even over the last six months after Charlottesville that this has been debated in the public that there, ha there are perspectives about shutting these people down that are more sympathetic or taken more seriously. Um, I think that reasonable people can disagree about how to shut down fascists, but the argument for stopping them, for no platforming them, is something that I think we just need to push, even if it's difficult. Um, I also think that we can think about groups can be different, and, but they can still coexist under a movement umbrella. And so the fact of the matter is there are going to be anti-fascist groups that do more militant actions that mainstream society is not going to be as psyched about. There will also be more outward-facing public formations that fight against fascism. There will be everyday people and communities that, that go out to demonstrations and do what they do. This is all going to happen no matter what any of us says. So how can we think of coexisting? That's, I think, sort of one of the takeaways of this. But um, yeah, and part of it depends on, on your goals. Some, some forms of organizing depend on getting popular support. Others don't. And I think they can coexist and complement each other. Um, one example would be in um, Spain and France, where there are, as of the last few years, these anti-fascist neighborhood assemblies. And so one of the examples would be in, in Madrid, where some of the Quince M.A. assemblies, the, that would be the, um, the Spanish, well, the Occupy was our version of their 15M. Uh, so one, some of these neighborhood assemblies became anti-fascist neighborhood assemblies as the Ogar Social, which is one of their fascist groups modeled on Casa Pound and Italy and others, started to, to give away free food only to ethnic Spaniards, organize eviction defense, but only for people who are getting evicted who are ethnic Spaniards and so forth. Um, so one of their neighborhood assemblies became an anti-fascist neighborhood assembly. A lot of the people who did this organizing also have their affinity groups, also participate in militant activities, but also participate in these neighborhood affinity groups. And so there's ways that you can kind of 
have your foot in both worlds, have them complement each other. I don't, I, just, I don't think it's all necessarily so black and white. So thank you for that question. Yes. Yeah, um, so I've done a lot of organizing and counter protests and stuff like that, and I worked with people who originally started with the Occupy movement. And it seems like they applied some of these strategies and tactics, they learned from that into, say, like counter protesting, um, you know, a Trump rally where there were neo Nazis and okay. like, I'm trying to sit at no platform or drown it out that kind of thing. Um, I was curious, and from what I understand about Occupy, it's like generally an autonomous anti capitalist stance. So, do you see a connection between what happened with Occupy and how anti fascism in the United States is growing? Sure. And can you talk about that a little bit, maybe? By sure. Right. Well, I mean, certainly the, the, the politics of any given Occupy was dependent on that Occupy and ranged the whole spectrum. Um, I wrote a book uh, called Translating Anarchy, just about New York, which I argued was fairly anarchist, relatively speaking. Um, but as far as the sort of larger conversation, I think there is something to be said about this decade of resistance and the kinds of direct action horizontal influences that have come from all sorts of directions. Um, so in the book I quote some, uh, I forgot his name, there was a writer in the New Yorker who wrote pejoratively about what he called the shut it down left. But I think that's a great name and one that we should, <laughs> but one that we should embrace. And, and that comes from all sorts of directions. It comes from Black Lives Matter. It comes from the immigrant rights movement. It comes from movements for queer and trans liberation, movements for feminism, Occupy. There's all sorts of examples, and anti-fascism being one of them, of using direct action from the ground up to resist. And so Occupy is certainly an early kind of example of that. You can even look earlier to the sort of the, the Madison State House occupation. But yeah, there's this, there's this sort of growth of this kind of politics that to some extent can be applied to all sorts of different circumstances. Um, and that's, I think, really heartening. I think Occupy, Occupy played a role in that. Um, in part also, because I think at least in my perspective, I don't know what folks who are involved out here would think, but it seemed like to a large extent prior to Occupy, the notion of protest was still a little bit outside of the mainstream. It was associated with hippies in the 60s and was kind of passe, but no one says that anymore. Um, and Occupy was one part of that. Um, but yeah, and some of the people I interviewed for the book were active in Occupy or active in Antifa groups today, um, which is partly what the media missed. The media always assumed that everything is just in its own box, that Antifa is this, Occupy is this. Um, but of course, people do all sorts of stuff and these, influencing go, these influences go in all sorts of directions. Um, so uh, let's go back there. So I just wanted to say thanks for coming to Seattle and thank you for writing this amazing book. Thank you. And not doing the typical historian as your intro, uh, you know, kind of led into, you know, waiting years and years to research. Um, I am a current uh, Bellevue College student and Bellevue College has been rife with white supremacy and we had a rash of flyering that has gone on mm. and we have seen administration do absolutely nothing, pretty much just, you know, throw up their diversity campaign and thought that that was, yeah. you know, welcoming the neo-Nazis was the way to go, right? Just ridiculous. So um, I want to thank you because the information that you're providing and the deeply rooted white supremacy issues we have in the Northwest are very serious. Mm. So I think that this is the time to kind of look at work like yours and everything you've compiled. The media in it is fucking awesome. All your references, everything are thank solid. You. So it's like, this is the time for that. So I just want to say thanks. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, just, just to, to, to briefly comment, um, universities cannot accept white supremacists and fascists or, or, or accept the notion that that's just sort of another opinion, just, just non-negotiable, yeah. Um, yes? Who do you think of the Department of Homeland Security? I'm against it. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a terrorist organization, yeah. yeah. What are the implications for yeah, that? Yeah. organizing with that? Like right, that? right. And, and also the conversations about gang labels, which, um, someone the other day told me that there, there was, that was sort of in the air about anti-racist action in the 90s too in terms of the kind of gang label being applied. Um, well, obviously the broader context is very disturbing, right? There's the black identity extremist label. There's the shift of the Trump administration away from uh, moving a lot of its resources away from investigating um, terrorism from white supremacists, 
uh, figures like Sebastian Gorka and others in the in the White House arguing that basically terrorism is synonymous with being a Muslim. Um, so th- there's a, there's a broader sh- conversation there. Um, certainly, it it's not entirely dissimilar from how the state has tried to tar really anyone. Uh, it's concerned with environmentalists, anarchists, um, to some extent, even even elements in Occupy. Um, and I mean, to, to, to get mildly meta, I mean, that's sort of in, embedded in the notion of terrorism itself is a way to demonize non-state violence. Um, and so I think it, it's, it's a category that always needs to be really interrogated at the very least. Um, but what to do about it? I mean, I think part of it, one, is, is to just push back and say, okay, agree or disagree with anti-fascist terrorism is not a legitimate label for this, and, and I mean, it's not even an organization, let alone a terrorist organization, but that's, you know. Um, and so part of it is, is to push back, to stand in solidarity with each other, um, to organize in support of the J-20 defendants, for example, the people who were um, arrested at the inauguration protests in DC and are charged with 70 and 80 years in jail um, for ridiculous non-reasons. Um, so, right, so there's an example where, to a large extent, the quote-unquote Trump resistance has ignored these people, but even if you disagree with some of the politics that some of them have, standing in solidarity is a way to push back against the efforts to label any one of us terrorists or anything else. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a concern, um, but not entirely a new concern and, and one that will persist in a different form, whatever the next movement is or the next issue is. So, uh, sure. This is probably not a single uh, answer question, but- It's okay. Uh, in the United States today. There you go. The state. All right, next? No. Um, uh, um, well, no, I mean, obviously that is the purveyor of violence that is most relevant to the conversation. And really, what's interesting about this is, right, we talk about fascism and anti-fascism, but as the three-way fight blog points out, is a three-way fight with the third part being the state, especially for anti-fascists who have anti-state politics. Um, and a lot of times, even in the Battle of Cable Street, right, the battle was really between anti-fascists and the police. So it brings into the question the role of the police and the state in this. Um, militant anti-fascists are very critical of both. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's basically going back to the terrorism question. That's really the dynamic going on here and can also be kind of segued into the like, okay, you can talk about American Vanguard or Richard Spencer like fascists, but you can also talk about the influences of fascism on all sorts of politics and, and think of it not just as a specific defined entity, but as a kind of influence that weaves its way into all sorts of things. Um, I interviewed some anti-fascists from a group in Bordeaux in France called Pave Brulant or Burning Pavement. And they organize against the far right where they live. They have a campaign going on against some identitarians who are doing a campaign, an anti-halal campaign under the guise of being pro-animal rights, which is, well, but that's an example, right? Uh, that also some of the far right will do um, Islamophobic uh, campaigns under the guise of being pro-LGBTQ. There's all these examples of trying to take things that are of the left and use it, right? Uh, White supremacists have also done that against kosher food in the same way. Um, so they do this organizing against the explicit far right groups, but they also claim that from their perspective, all political parties in France are to some extent fascistic, as they saw it. Um, and that's especially, I think, important way of looking at it in a country that has so much Islamophobia even on the left, right? So that's another way of looking at it too, which I think has to be part of the conversation as well, is not just what are these small groups doing, but how do their ideas influence all sorts of conversations and discourses and policies. And then in that sense, we're talking about the state, we're talking about capitalism. And, and that's kind of the payoff to this, is, is to some extent, you know, the, the discourse gets so bogged down in these specific anti-fascists, these specific fascists, but really that's sort of an entryway into talking about the bigger picture. So. You mentioned the uh, um, particular, um, like the role of Islamophobia yeah. and, in, in far right organizing, and I was wondering if your book touches on, if you have any comments on um, Antifa um, associations with uh, fighting against ISIS. Um, mm-hmm. is that, mm-hmm. I have, like, yeah. You know, has that in any ways like is that complicated that that 
Um, well, I, I don't know. I don't, I mean, it's possible, but I don't know of anyone who considers fighting ISIS to be Islamophobic. Um, I think that people of good faith realize that that's not what Islam's about, yeah. right? Um, but to, to just sort of uh, elaborate on the background, certainly um, perhaps the most dramatic, explicitly anti-fascist struggle going on right now is in the context of the Rojava Revolution, where um, people from the region and people from around the world have journeyed to help the uh, egalitarian socialist revolution underway in Kurdistan uh, fight back against the Turkish state, against ISIS, against all sorts of enemies on all sides. Um, some of those folks um, I know from Occupy Wall Street in New York. Um, one of the folks I know unfortunately died in the struggle. Um, far too many have died in the struggle. But from I interviewed some of those folks for the book, and they, they emphasize that the people involved in the struggle, no matter where they're from, essentially see this as an anti-fascist struggle. There's a lot of anti-fascist imagery. There's all sorts of photos of you know, German and other anti-fascist flags being hung. Uh, and some of the groups have names that are harken back to the Spanish Revolution. Um, so, I mean, certainly that's a dynamic in, in anti-fascism that is completely ignored by the media. Um, and is, I think, an important counterpoint to the argument that anti-fascist politics can always be nonviolent. I don't know what the nonviolent way out of fighting ISIS is or fighting Hitler would have been. Um, so I think that, that that's an important that can't be ignored. So um, people who don't know about that should, should uh, read about it. Uh, all right, let's, I'm going to take you in the back, but I'm going to check in with Grace on how we're doing on time. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, all right. So I'm going to take the question in the back, and then who else wants to get in before we um, move to book signing, saying goodnight, moving on? All right, so let's do one, two, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. So go ahead in the back. So I have kind of a twofold question. Part of it really is the optical question. Yeah. Kind of it, but there's been a lot of um, talk and TED Talks and people um, discussing sort of engaging the others. The election, okay, right. Sort of a matter of survival for many of us, with mm. friends and family, but also, in, you know, trying in popular politics or such to keep people on the right side at least of and getting works and things like that. So I'm wondering your idea on engaging the other, and particularly yeah. as it relates to like more at risk or marginal mm. viewpoints that aren't necessarily so much paid, where they're on board with like you know taking down people in a bigoted way in a violent manner so much as people who might get there. So trying to be more sort of inclusive, I guess, and where, you know, wherever, and that line is so muddy, it's difficult. Mm. But, um, and then also kind of related, um, this is sort of a politics 101 comment, I think, but sure. you know how we're in this political spectrum, kind of um, the fascist and, um, and um, like the you know Mussolini and Hitler sort of extremes, how they can they kind of come around because the political spectrum is a circle in the end. Um, as as that goes, um, are the the extremes? There's this idea, and again, it's not. I've heard of it. Yeah. I think the super bigoted extreme. <laughs> yeah. We get there, but the people more on the on the edge of getting to the extreme. But there's this idea that people need to express in a First Amendment sort of way their whatever type of viewpoint you bigoted mm -hmm. in order to not have a repressed group that mm -hmm. then revolts and creates violence. So I'm curious mm -hmm. too uh, about your thoughts on how that is of course a democratic right and how and where's where's the line and the, where does it get too horrible and what do we do to yeah. get getting bigger and you know that's what Okay, yeah. All right. All right. Um a few things there. Um, so in terms of the first part of your question, um, I have a section in the book based on an article I wrote for Roar Magazine about everyday anti-fascism, which um, are some thoughts that I threw out there about trying to push back against efforts by the alt-right and related folks to make racism great again, make sexism great again. And it, it's a focus on how ultimately we can't ignore the kind of meta question of what society thinks about these kinds of things because even explicitly militant anti-fascist organizing, you know, doxing only works if people think it's bad to be a Nazi, for example. And so there is kind of a, a back and forth on that. I, I always think of a debate that, that emerged in the German communist movement in the early 30s around the slogan, 
which I can't remember the exact slogan, but it was something to the effect of um, smash a Nazi wherever you see him. Nazis something like that, right? Nazis off small. Okay, so there you go. Um, and there, so on the one hand is, okay, whenever you see someone who's, who's affiliated with a Nazi party, confront them. The, the other argument is, no, we need to win them over. And, well, I mean, I think there's something to both of them, right? I mean, because you, you do want to win people over who are on the fence. Uh, fascism grows when people who are susceptible to it see the right as being better able to meet their needs than the left, right? So there is a popular politics component to it, but there is also a confrontation component to it. I don't think that either is inherently right as contextual, and to some extent you want to do both, I guess, right, somehow. Um, but in the context of that kind of Trump moment, I was really alarmed at the response of a lot of, like, white intellectuals to Trump's victory, which was to try and find every way possible to focus on sympathizing with racist people who supported Trump and putting that kind of consideration over the consideration of the people who are going to uh, suffer and who are suffering, right? So I think that certainly, right, we need to build movements that can organize those who have been only the subject of the disdain of the liberal establishment that involves organizing in rural, rural areas, for example. Groups like Redneck Revolt have focused on that in interesting ways. Um, but on the other hand, also recognize that at a certain point, if people choose to take substantive actions to promote white supremacist policies, then, then they are putting themselves in an antagonistic position with people who are suffering and resistance is legitimate. So, you know, it's, it's a, I think it's a delicate balance and there is no right or wrong to, to it. It's a matter of context, but I think both need to be taken into account. Now, the, the extremism question, um, I disagree with the extremism paradigm. Um, I think that the notion that at the far left and far right they become the same isn't correct, in my opinion, um, in part because it's a paradigm that grows out of the assumption that what we think of as the center is the, is the center of politics. Um, so it normalizes your kind of centrist, uh, classically liberal perspectives, and by portraying everything that's outside of it as an extreme, it, it normalizes the center. Um, I, I always like to think of the example of the, the politics of the early Soviet Union when there was a right deviation, there was a left deviation, there were those in the center. So even in the context of politics that most Americans would find extremists, there was a spectrum. Uh, if you read um, literature on Spanish anarchism, uh, a lot of historians talk about the anarcho-syndicalists as like the moderates of the anarchism. Everyone always wants to make an extremes out of, ex you know, so all is to say, uh, I, I, I'm not a fan of the spectrum model of politics. Um, Certainly anti-fascists and fascists are generally illiberal insofar as they are not of the center, but apart from that, um, differ in everything else. Um, so uh, I, 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 I don't think that's a, a useful paradigm. It also relates to sort of a Cold War tendency to um, try to equate the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany through the paradigm of totalitarianism as a way to justify the Cold War struggle. It's you know very historically contextualized um, framework. Um, uh, I don't remember any, any was that, does that pretty much cover most of the things that? I guess just, I, I sort of put like two topics in one. The other piece of that one was um, if there's not agreement between the extremes, then why are there extremes? Yeah, 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 okay, right. Yeah, I knew there was something else there, I couldn't remember it. So the, the argument that if you shut down fascists, they will be um, frustrated and therefore more dangerous to grow. Well. We can look at how fascist and far-right movements grow. There have been, unfortunately, plenty of them. How they grow is well-documented. You can read any of these histories or the current events about how um, Costa Pound or Golden Dawn grow. Um, I don't know of any examples of simply being shut down, therefore leading to them growing. The ways that they grow are pretty self-evident. They, they embed themselves in communities. They meet people's needs. The Golden Dawn will give out free food to ethnic Greeks in the context of a uh, economic downturn. Um, people like that. The welfare state's falling apart. They'll turn to that. They, t they, they play into sort of you know xenophobic uh, and racist societal perspectives. Um, they embed themselves in football culture, in martial arts culture. Um, so, 
fascism succeeds when it makes its perspectives about race or about nation or about gender or about sexuality seem natural and eternal and gets people to believe that. The key is to, to, to not let any of that seem natural or eternal, because none of it is. Um, so to me, understanding the politics of how they grow should dictate strategies for stopping that. And so you can key in on all these different dynamics and look at the way that the tiki torch wielding Nazis dressed in khakis because they wanted college students to see them, or white college students, to see themselves in that. So could that happen? Yeah, it could happen. It is happening. And so the way to, to, to some extent to make it not happen is to be like, if you step on that side of this, your life is going to become hell. One way or another, we're going to tell your parents, we're going to tell your community, we're going to, you know, I mean, that's what happened. There's a lot of these folks came home to lose their jobs, to find themselves as prize and say, oh, I didn't know what I was doing. Well, if you step on that side of this and you start waving that torch, you've made a decision and you're going to have to pay for it. And, you know, to me, that's, I think, the kind of actual tangible reality of what this amounts to. Um, did you want to jump in? Oh, oh, because you, you looked like, all right, well, we're going to go to the last question over here and then I can write my name in your book if you want. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You referred to the Barcelona labor leader and his compartmental mm -hmm. solutions of, say, civil support and, and direct action. Mm. And I, you know, when you stated that, I was just thinking that's very, very analogous to the situation of the soldier for the state going off to war um, and perpetuating violence mm. and then returning to civil life. Well. Um so, so is am I understanding you correctly that basically this is a critique of of violence? Is I'm just, I, no, I'm not not really that sure what compartmentalization of being a civic, you know, a member of civil society, and then having you know direct the difference. Right. Historically, you see that the soldier who goes off to fight for the state mm -hmm. will then return to civil society and have those. I understand. I think the differences are one that part of the point he was making was that people don't know that he's both, or at least most people don't know. And so in that way, it, it compartmentalizes in the way that people, you know, soldiers, you, you know. That. And the other thing is like, it's, it's not a this then that, but sort of a, well, what's going on this month? Well, there's a strike this month, but there's a far right demonstration next month. And it's, it's more of a kind of fluid situation. Um, and also, I think that a lot of the anti-fascists I spoke to, especially those who are involved in the labor movement, see anti-fascism as a labor struggle. And for them, it's not necessarily so, so black and white. But, but thank you for that. OK, so I'm going to wrap it up there. And um, thank you for coming out. Thank you, Grace. Thank you to the bookshop. Have a good night.